Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science Pub, where we virtually bring you the experiences and efforts of the top minds at Oregon State University. Tonight, we're going to be joined by Tom Kay, PhD, Associate Professor of the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology at OSU. Before we get started tonight, a couple changes for you for the academic year 2021 for Science Pub. I'm officially very happy to announce that the two campuses in Corvallis and Bend will unite to bring you monthly digital event content, which we are very excited to do. Uh, look out for Science Pubs to occur regularly on the second Monday of each month with events sprinkled throughout as we bring you to some of the content that you already love, plus hopefully a couple few new virtual surprises uh, as we go throughout the year. So stay tuned for that. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the OSU Cascades or OSU uh, newsletters, um, specifically where we are talking about some of the upcoming events. Uh, before we get started, uh, those of you new to our online content, um, we do have a way for you to engage in our uh, programs. Um, clearly, you're viewing through YouTube Live or Facebook Live. Uh, if you are logged into those services, you can use the chat functions in there, and we will moderate those questions. But you can also use Mintimeter, uh, found at www.minty.com, or download the Mintimeter app from your favorite app store uh, via your uh, mobile devices. What we're going to do is we're going to be having up here on the screen in just a second, the event number for tonight, that code you're going to actually input in at minty.com. And that's your way to ask us some questions tonight after Tom's present, uh, presentation. So we have a number of folks registered this evening. Uh, thoughts out to everybody that's impacted currently by the fires in Oregon and definitely California. Uh, but we are, we're thinking about you this evening and glad that you can join us for a little bit of respite um, away from kind of what's going on in the world. The other thing is too, if you have any questions after this event, you can definitely contact us at events at osucascades.edu. Um, so that's something that we can do. Uh, but real quick, I'm gonna do a, an introduction of our speaker tonight. We are gonna go through the trivia for this evening. Um, actually, we'll go to the trivia first so we can actually uh, get that rolling. Um, tonight, and I just had a computer freeze, so sorry about that real quick. Um, we are going to go through our quizzes for this evening. And first up, um, those of you that were able to see them, we've got first question being, what habitat type comprised the majority of the Willamette Valley before European settlers arrived? And of our four answers that were up there, um, the answer to that first question is B, prairie. Second question up for this evening is the Willamette Valley National Wildlife Refuge Complex was established for the dusky Canada goose. While this species winters here, where does it nest? Nest. And the correct answer for that one is Alaska, the Copper River Delta. For the third one, how many species are listed as threatened or endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Oregon? The correct answer for that one is 38. Fourth question for the night, how many species have been removed from the threatened or endangered list in Oregon because they are recovered? Answer to that one is A, six. Next question. What percentage of the Earth's plant species require insects for pollination? That would be C, 65%. Number six. What percentage of the Earth's plant species are considered endangered by the International Union of Concerned Scientists? The answer to that one is 4%. That's 4% of those plant species are considered endangered. Number seven, how many months of the year do most butterfly species spend as caterpillars? Answer to that one of three, five, nine, or 11 is 11, answer D. Number eight, what is the main driver of species extinction worldwide? B, habitat loss. Nine, which of these common invasive plants is considered a noxious weed by the Oregon Department of Agriculture? All of the above. Canada thistle? the English ivy, and the scotch broom. And finally, 10 for our trivia questions for the night. The first OSU Cascades Energy Systems Engineering graduating class occurred in what year? Oh, this is the wrong question. Well, the correct answer, I believe, on this one, Tom, is actually the pollinator, which is the best pollinator, if I'm remembering the question correctly, and that one is bumblebee. So Nathan has officially made the first error <laughs> of trivia questions. Um, but anyway, the answer to that one, again, the question being around uh, the best pollinator, the correct answer to that one is the bumblebee. B. 
All right. Well, thank you for joining that. And a couple little uh, snafus as we get going for this wonderful fall quarter um, as we get started with classes resuming next week. So kind of exciting times for Oregon State University. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. So Dr. Tom Kay specializes in habitat restoration, invasive species control, endangered species reintroduction, population dynamics of plants, population viability analysis, monitoring, and conservation planning. In addition, his interests include plant pollinator interactions and plant systematics. Uh, so Tom graduated with a BS from the Evergreen State College in 1984 and worked for the US Forest Service and National Park Service until 1987. He received his master's degree uh, in 1989 and PhD in 2001 from our own Oregon State University. On ta on Tom, on behalf of the audience tonight, I'd like to thank you very much for your time this evening and I will turn it over to you. All right. Thanks very much, Nathan. And it's really great to be here tonight and uh, really hoping that everybody out there is safe and breathing clean air as much as possible. This is a difficult time for all of us. And uh, my heart goes out to all of you who've faced losses of any kind during this event. Um, tonight, I want to talk to you about endangered species and bringing them back from near extinction. I'm going to switch to my slides now and bring those up and sharing screen and here we go. Um, so I'm gonna talk in particular about a species called golden paintbrush. And my discipline really is focused around uh, plants, plant science, botany. So I'm gonna use for you an example tonight that I've worked on for many years which is this species of paintbrush that occurs in grasslands and prairies in Canada, Washington, and Oregon. Now, this is among many species that are threatened with extinction. Like the trivia question pointed out, there's something like 4% of the plants in the world are headed towards extinction or already extinct. In the United States, that number ticks up to about 5%. And <clears throat> The, the question is, is there anything we can do about this? And the answer is, we're gonna to get to that right away. And the answer is, well, yes, uh, it's about putting our shoulder to the wheel. Um, I work as the executive director of the Institute for Applied Ecology here in Corvallis, Oregon, uh, where the air quality index is currently 302, I believe. And uh, generally quite good weather, but uh, right now it's a little smoky. Uh, but in this picture, it's always spring at IAE. And uh, we're a nonprofit that focuses on endangered species recovery and their restoration, their science and uh, education. Uh, so those are the three themes in our mission. Um, before I get started too far, I want to acknowledge many people that have participated in some of the research that I'm going to uh, reveal for you tonight. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been our primary funding funder. Um, I've had several grad students, including Beth Lawrence, Katie Jones, Ian Finkston, Caitlin Lawrence, Isaac Sandlin, all work on golden paintbrush in one manner or another. We've had many staff members and volunteers participate and government agencies like the Natural Resource Conservation Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Benton County, Greenbelt Land Trust, Army Corps, City of Eugene, Nature Conservancy, Portland Metro, and private landowners, many folks have participated. So this is not a solo effort by any stretch. And that's just what's going on in Oregon. Uh, many of this, much of this work is mirrored in Washington State as well. So this is the plant we're talking about, golden paintbrush, the Castilea levisecta. Now these are our species that are in the paintbrush or figwort family, and they're quite showy. They make good poster children for uh, endangered species conservation. Uh, I'm gonna actually start at the end of this talk. I'm gonna tell you where we are now with conservation, and then I'm gonna tell much of this talk through flashback. Uh, so right now, we have actually brought this species from total extirpation in Oregon uh, back to several populations, some of which are quite large. And this photograph from the Finley National Wildlife Refuge here in the central Willamette Valley, you can see that the plants uh, can number in the thousands and cover great meadows. And this is all due to reintroduction efforts and partnerships. 
This is another image of what that can look like when the plants are growing very thickly. And it's quite a, a wildflower show, really. Um, in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia combined, the wild populations have remained fairly flat over time. And you can see my mouse, I hope, that shows this blue line is the wild populations that have essentially been stable or declining over time. Whereas if we look at the uh, populations that include introductions, which started in about 2010, the population has skyrocketed, kind of like human population meets the Industrial Revolution. This is an incredible uh, explosion of, of populations and, and plant numbers throughout the species range. When we focus on what's going on in Oregon, um, we have a very similar part of that, that overall pattern. Starting in 2011, the year after introduction started, the populations have really shot upward. And this goes through 2018 and 2019 uh, was a further increase. So the populations have really increased with this sustained application of effort to get new populations on the ground. And this is a result of about 25 pounds of seed which maybe not sound like much, but when you translate in that, that into the number of seeds, we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of 57 million seeds that we've put on the ground. So you, know, you do the math, it's actually not, many of those seeds don't go anywhere, but when you have a lot of seeds, you can make a big difference. Um, when we look at not just the total number of plants, but the number of populations, we also see a steady increase in, in numbers. Uh, the red line is the total number of populations that we've seen increase over time. And we're currently at around 23 populations. Um, for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, criteria for recovering the species and removing it from the endangered species list, we actually need at least five populations that are greater than 1,000 each. And we've actually met that threshold too. This blue line is just populations of over 1,000 individuals. And we've crept up over the five mark, and we're really, uh, we've really contributed a lot towards getting the species towards recovery. Um, much of what I'm going to tell you about in the rest of this talk is how we got here, and uh, what's the research that enabled this kind of success? And also, why is there a question mark applied to this? Why are we not just celebrating that we've got there? Because there actually are some uncertainties and some lingering threats that we need to address. So. The first flashback is to this guy, Thomas Howell. Uh, he was a botanist here in Oregon. He worked in Washington as well. He got around uh, back in the 1800s. So he got around on a horse uh, he, and foot. Uh, this guy was intrepid. He traveled widely, uh, but he was not using modern convenience. And he's the first white person known to bring this plant to uh, our science and, and make a specimen of it for preservation and describe this plant as a new species for science. And he did so in a place called Mill Plain, which was across the Willamette River from what's now Portland and uh, just east of Vancouver. And so we're actually part of Vancouver now. So this is a uh, artist's rendition of what that general area looked like back in the day. This is Fort Vancouver. And you can see there's hardly anybody there. It's a big, broad plain, mill plain, some, some pastures, et cetera. But when you fast forward to today, this is what it looks like. And I don't know if you can read this on your screen, but you know these are streets that are named Mill Plain Boulevard and Fourth Plain Boulevard. And of course, Interstate 5. Uh, this is... You know, the, the habitat's long gone. It's long under houses and streets. There are some bits of prairie around there left over, but none of them have these kinds of species left on. They're, they're, they're long gone. So what do we do about this when we lose the habitat? Well, one of the things we do is we go back to where there are a few existing populations or at least sites where they used to occur and try to learn something about what that habitat looks like now or what it might've looked like in the past. Now, this is one of the few remaining wild populations of the species in a place called Rocky Prairie in Western Washington, just south of Olympia. And it's this very odd landscape, this topography of mounds. It's called a mounded prairie, or in other places called a biscuit scan, 
or in sometimes it's called a Mima Prairie. And that's the name of this site is Mima Prairie. So no one really knows how these mounds were formed. And it's really not material to our story today. But some folks think it was because of pocket gophers that were collecting soil and, and having territories. Others think, like I do, that it's a pattern that develops at the edge of glaciated areas. I accept that hypothesis more. But there's a raging debate, and there's not agreement. And there's kind of convincing evidence on both sides. This is another aerial view of what these kinds of landscapes can look like very different than a regular prairie in the Willamette Valley. These are uh, a fascinating uh, topography. And the golden paintbrush tends to occur up on top of the mounds or when it's dry enough between the mounds. It really depends on the hydrology. Um, this is me back in 1984 when I was uh, going to school at uh, the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And I got a job working for uh, the Nature Conservancy for a few weekends one spring. And my job was to go park next to that prairie with all the mounds on it and be a deterrent to keep people from driving their off-road vehicles on it because this had been purchased as a preserve and people were still driving around having a good time and, and they didn't know what to do about it. They kept building fences and people would drive through them. So my job was to actually just be there and look like they weren't supposed to be there. I, I was the no trespassing sign. So it was a real high bar for me, but I was real proud to get that Nature Conservancy hat and get, and get out there. And that's when I met Golden Paintbrush. And this is a photograph I took in 1984 when I had this job out at Rocky Prairie. And I had, I had a great time just walking around looking at plants and stuff. And little did I know that years later, I'd be involved in bringing this species back. But this species stuck with me. It's one of those species that I connected with early in my career and, you know, in a way made a promise to that I wanted to keep working on this and bring it back. I just didn't know that I'd actually get to. Um, if we... If we flash back to what was going on in Oregon in 1938, the last specimen of this species was collected in the wild. Um, it was collected at a place called Peterson Butte Cemetery, which is due east of Corvallis across the Willamette Valley, where it's very smoky right now, and in Lynn County. And uh, it was in this cemetery at the base of this big butte. And uh, you can go there today, and here's the cemetery. There's gravestones. It's it's a, a, a beautiful spot to rest in peace, uh, but I couldn't find any golden paintbrush when I went back and, and decided to look. Uh, and I climbed up on the butte too, and I, I looked all over the place uh, back in that day. Um, and uh, when I moved back to Oregon, I, I learned more about this species again. And uh, it's, it was listed as threatened by the federal government in 1997. Okay, that's when it finally got on the, the list. Um, it is a, a prairie species that grows only in the Pacific Northwest and only in prairies. It, it doesn't get around much. Um, it's a perennial uh, and it's a hemiparasite. And we're gonna come back to what we mean by that later, but suffice it to say that it uh, connects to other plants and what's growing around it matters to it. And what's growing around it can either be a, a grass, like the Romer's fescue on the left, or a forb, like the Oregon sunshine on the right, also called woolly sunflower. And it, so this is kind of a generalist parasite. Um, first thing, one of the first things I did in my research on the species in Oregon was to understand the mating system of the species. We needed to know this because we needed to know uh, how important it was to have genetic diversity in a population and how important pollinators were. And uh, some of the things we did was, were cross plants of different relationship. So for example, we selfed plants. We just took pollen from one flower on a plant and put it on another flower on the same plant. We crossed between siblings that we grew out from the same seed pod on a mom plant. So cross to a sibling, so closely related individual. We also cross to just some other plant from the same population or to a plant from a very different population farther away. On the left, we're really looking at what happens with inbreeding and what's on the right, we're looking what happens without breeding. And we can have inbreeding depression, which is when you self, uh, like uh, you know, royal families that get too inbred and, and you get uh, reductions in fitness of those, those um, uh, progeny. 
Or we can have something called outbreeding depression, where you're crossed to someone who's so distantly related to you that you actually have a loss of fitness in that direction too. But we didn't know what was going to happen in this case. And uh, we had to actually take pollen from uh, a flower. And this is the, the, where the pollen is occurring on a flower. Also over here, this little on this upper part of the gallia. And we'd move it to the stigma up here or up here on the, on the plant. So we had to manipulate plants uh, directly ourselves. And here's some interns uh, that are out there doing that uh, cross-pollination in a greenhouse. Um, and we actually use different colors of thread to track the different uh, crosses we made. And some of the things we found are here. So that when we self the plants, we found that they had very, very reduced production of viable seeds. And when we um, crossed to a sibling, we also had reduced but better viable seed compared to a cross to another plant in the same population. And when we crossed to a different population, we didn't have outbreeding depression. We actually had hybrid fitness. We had improvement in uh, seed uh, set. So fitness went up when we crossed to different plants. And that fitness carried over, not just to seed set, but to the growth of the progeny themselves. They just got bigger. And so that's, that was a strong signal and something we used later on when we mixed seeds uh, from known populations that were surviving in Washington to create a population in Oregon. Another flashback, uh, Morton and Jesse Peck. Morton Peck was a professor at Willamette University. His herbarium is currently housed at Oregon State in Corvallis. And he was another one of these intrepid botanists, a little bit later than Thomas Howell, but he also got around on on horse with his wife. They, they were quite a team and they, they got all over Oregon and collected all kinds of crazy plants. But he also collected uh, golden paintbrush from right there in Salem where Willamette University was. So he could walk out from the university and walk out into prairies and find this species which then became extinct in the state. Uh, he, he was able to find it and he wrote down information about it on this label. This is called a herbarium label. This is what stuck to a, a sheet of paper with a dead plant glued to it. And one thing he found or wrote, wrote was that the plant was growing in moist open ground. So one of the questions we had uh, starting our work in Oregon was, what was the habitat of this species, really? I mean, we knew what it, what it looked like in Washington, but the Willamette Valley is very different than those mounded prairies and coastal prairies in Washington where this species occurred. And um, one of the things that's different about the Willamette Valley is we have vast grasslands that are wetlands, that are very soggy. And most of them are into grass seed production now, but you know they're really different than a gravelly, upland, glaciated soil prairie. So one of the things we did was uh, put plants at a bunch of different sites in the Willamette Valley. So each of these triangles re represents a uh, population that we started with lots of different plants from Washington. Um, and so we asked, well, some of these sites are wetland and some of them are upland, and some are a mix. And so we asked, does the habitat matter? And so we went to an upland like this, and you can see an upland prairie, and we went to a wetland prairie, still looks like grassland, well, maybe it won't matter. But what we found was a uh, pretty easy to interpret bar graph. Uplands, the plants survived pretty well, and in wetlands, they mostly died. So no, it's not a wetland plant. So we could cross that off our list of, of habitats to explore and uh, explore other questions instead. So this uh, person here is, is Beth Lawrence, and she was a graduate student of mine that, that conducted some of this research by putting what we call common gardens at various places in the Willamette Valley. And those common gardens were made up of plants from multiple different sites in Washington. And that's what's shown up here. All these different dots were the source populations. And one of our questions was, which population in Washington is going to grow well in Oregon? Uh, you know, we've got the, the closest population here at Rocky Prairie, but these ones might actually work pretty well too. And because it's all extinct in Oregon, it's not like we're gonna have some weird genetic mixing with what's already here. So let's just use what's gonna work. So we are screening the population for what worked best. And at the same time, we were testing habitats in different locations in Oregon to see which habitats work best. 
not just the wetland question, but the habitat quality, the, the soil conditions, the uh, abundance of invasive species, that sort of thing. And what we found was that the similarity in the plant community to where we put the plant from where it came from was a good predictor of population success. And so the, what, the populations that survived the best, the proportion that survived, were those that had communities that were in Oregon very similar to the communities where they came from in Washington. And as that community became more and more different, the survival of those plants declined. And one of those signals for difference was how weedy the populations were, especially annual grasses and, and annual forbs. And when those annuals got in there, the populations tend to, tended to not survive well. And what we found was in Washington, the existing populations had very few of those annual weeds. So that was a strong signal and something we paid attention to. We also needed to grow the plant in Oregon in order to create a seed source to, to work with. And, and this is uh, from the farm field where we put this plant into agricultural production. And it's on a fescue plant. And you can see from how it's circling the plant, the circling the grass, this is actually all one golden paintbrush plant. And as a parasite, it's encircled the grass. Now, this is what it's doing as a parasite. Uh, we call it a hemiparasite because although it's connecting to another plant and drawing resources, it's also green and capable of producing some of its own resources too. So it's just hemiparasitic. But it is in there tapping into the root systems of other plants. And you can see these, these roots coming in from the left and then making these sort of suction cup balls on this other root. These are golden paintbrush roots and they're coming in and attaching to, in this case, a yarrow root and starting to pump resources out of it. So these are like vampires underground that are just actually literally pulling, pulling the blood out of these plants. Although in this case, the blood is, is foam and, and, and um, uh, is it, a variety of juices that might be water or, or sugars or even other, other compounds that the plant has made as a defense. And so it can incorporate these defensive chemicals into its own tissues and have, now have a defense against, say, insects chewing on it. So it's a vampire that sucks the superpowers right out of other plants. Um, and so we were really interested in, in finding out how different host plants can affect this uh, golden paintbrush. We know it's parasitic, but you know, how much does it matter? And one thing we found was that when you grow it without a host, it can grow pretty well. And when you grow it with a woolly sunflower, it can grow pretty well. And when you grow it with a fescue, it can grow pretty well. But when you grow it with both, it grows the best. And that's what was happening down here. This composite performance index showed that actually when you grow it with fescue, it, it doesn't grow as well as when you grow it with a woolly sunflower. But when you grow it with both, it does better. It prefers a mixed diet. This is actually a generalist parasite. It doesn't have uh, this host preference that you might think it, that some of these rare species should have. But one of the things we also found is this happened in the greenhouse. When we took these out into the wild, we found that growing without a host was actually better. And then growing it with a grass was about the same, but growing it with woolly sunflower or in a mixture where woolly sunflower was in that mix actually created a vulnerability for the plant. Why was this? That didn't make any sense. I mean, yeah, sometimes the greenhouse doesn't work like the, the real world, but this is what was going on. There were voles out in the real world, and we didn't have rodents in the greenhouse. And these voles would tunnel under the plants that had woolly sunflower because apparently they preferred to eat woolly sunflower roots. So even though woolly sunflower was a, a dynamite host or a part of a mix that made a good band, it was a vulnerability in years when voles were very abundant. And it just so happened that we did this research in a year with a spike in the vole population. Vole population cycle, and we were just lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, to do our experiment in a year when the vole population was high. And the proportion of uh, plants near tunnels was much higher for the, the woolly sunflower um, or the mix of woolly sunflower. So woolly sunflower was attracting these voles. So 
We also did greenhouse experiments to find out, well, does this plant just grow with some hosts? I mean, maybe it's fescue and woolly sunflower, but does it matter? Um, so we threw a whole bunch of species at it, you know, woolly sunflower, Romer's fescue, like we already talked about. Um, prairie June grass uh, is up here. This is self heal. This is yarrow. This is um, uh, checker mallow, all kinds of plants from different flat families, different uh, plant strategies. You know, some of them have to be good or bad. So we threw them all at it. In fact, we threw even more than that. And this is what we found is under the microscope, they produced these, these uh, attachments called Hostoria on every species we exposed them to, okay? So golden paintbrush can parasitize all these different grasses at the top, all of them. It can parasitize all these, this is two different things in the composite family. This is a mint. This is in the mallow family. This is in the verbena family. It didn't care. And guess what? It could parasitize itself which is just sort of a new kind of disgusting. But you know, these, these plants, it's a general parasite. It's, it can parasitize anything, but that doesn't mean everything is a good host. It just means this plant is opportunistic and exploratory in its behavior. So we, we grew it in the greenhouse like this and we asked, does the neighbor identity matter? And we actually controlled who the neighbor was by planting the neighbor with the plant out in the wild just like we did with woolly sunflower and, and Romer's fescue, but we did it with many more species in a year without an explosion in the vole population. So we got a different signal that happened. And so this is what happens. We, we grew it out in a, in a grassland. We planted them out in a grassland with these companion hosts, but we also planted in a grassland where we killed all the, the existing ambient vegetation. So we didn't have alternative hosts for the plants to connect to. So I'm really gonna talk just about that scenario with the single hosts, so we could tease out that question. And the multiple hosts was interesting too, but I'm not gonna get into that. And what we found was that um, for the probability of survival, which is shown here, that the species did matter. There was differences among species, but we had generally higher survival when the host was a grass than when the host was a four. In fact, this is where the plant has no host over here. So this is the control. And you can see that even some of these hosts have, have lower survival than if you grew it alone in, in, out in a, in a field. So some hosts are actually kind of contraindicated, at least when alone. This is what happened when the response variable was flowering instead of just survival. Grasses were about the same as growing it uh, with, with a alone, but forbs, increased flowering in some cases, although in some cases it declined. So it does matter what the host is, but some of what matters may depend on which life trait you're talking about, survival versus reproduction. So the net effect could be actually complicated. And worse yet, we know the species has a varied diet. So it may really depend on the mix, the blend of species around it. And here's what we, one of the things we found is that as the number of species of perennial plants, the richness of species surrounding where we planted within 10 centimeters of the rooting zone, it, as that richness increases, the survival of the plant increases substantially. So this is another suggestion that there's a varied diet by the, by the species. It's not just a varied diet, but it needs a varied diet. Why would that be? Well, there, there are two main explanations for why biological diversity increases ecosystem function. One of them is that you have more species that um, uh, can be winners in any given year or in any situation. So that's called um, uh, the, the um, sampling effect. So if you have more species to choose from, you have more species that might be a good host. But there's another hypothesis, which is that the more species you have, the more complementarity you have. So that if you need a varied diet, maybe you need one resource from a plant part of the year, but then during another part of the year, that plant's died away, but another one is growing. Or from this plant, you're getting water. From this plant, you're getting sugar. And from this plant, you're getting some kind of defensive compound. So by having multiple species present, you have a better chance of survival because you have this varied diet. And of course, 
those two hypotheses are not mutually exclusive and often difficult to tease apart in ecological experiments. That's what happens with perennials. But when you look at annuals, it's the other way around. And why might that be? Why would having more kinds of annuals around you be bad? Well, what do annuals do at the end of every season? They die. So you formed these, co these connections to uh, a host, and that was costly to do, and that host just ups and dies on you. And if you have more and more of those hosts that are sort of taking up your resources to make connections, it drains your fitness and you end up dying instead. So we know now that the habitat for the species needs to have high diversity of perennials and low diversity of annuals. Not necessarily zero diversity, but, but lower. This is what happens in an agricultural field when we grow the plant with just uh, one host that's capable of supporting the plant. They grow pretty well, you take away all the weeds, everybody's happy. And what we did was we mixed the, the best, oops, sorry, we mixed the best sources from multiple populations it, that survived in Washington. And um, we promoted genetic diversity. Remember, when these things cross between populations, you get a boost, at least temporarily, in fitness. So we wanted to leverage that, that uh, um, hybrid vigor, that heterosis, uh, to our favor to make seeds that have a little boost, at least in the short term. And then we can take those plants and, and put them out on the landscape like we've been doing. And like I showed you at first, is actually creating many and large populations in Oregon. One of the questions is though, What's better, putting out seeds or putting out plants? Um, in this photograph on the right is a colleague of mine in Washington, P Peter Dunwitty, who's experimented very similar things and found the same things we have, that putting out plugs of plants, well, it can work, at least in the short term. Um, and putting out seeds over here can actually work too. Uh, so here's a seeded meadow uh, with, with a golden paintbrush. Um, so which is better? Well. The establishment rate from transplants is generally around 50% after the first year. Uh, from seeds, it's like 0.2% of the seeds make a plant. Well, that's, that's terrible sounding, right? Well, if you have a lot of seeds, it's not so bad. It's like, uh, you know, if you want to win the lottery, you need to buy a whole lot of tickets. And so that's what we've done, is we've overwhelmed the low odds of establishment by putting out millions of seeds. And that's easy to do because these plants produce a lot of seeds and they're tiny. So another question is, uh, should you put out seeds from just like one population or should you intentionally mix that genetic diversity? We think mixing is good, but when we put them into a nursery field and bring in a mixture of source populations in that nursery field, we're assuming that those plants are crossing with each other and that those seeds we put out are actually as diverse as the nursery we established. But that's not always what happens in a nursery. Sometimes there's domestication selection. Sometimes there's a single lineage that is easier to harvest than the others. And we could be completely fooling ourselves. And so we decided to check on that. And what we found was uh, up here, wild source populations have separate genetic signatures shown here in different colors. And then when we mix these into a nursery, and I'll show you the path through the Oregon nursery, we find that those separate colors are maintained because we, we planted those plants in different rows for different populations. So we, we, we are growing what we think we're growing. And when we put them out into a reintroduction, we mix them here and we put them out into introduction sites, either as plugs, or as seeds, we find that indeed, the same populations that we sourced in the wild are propagating through and are being found in the reintroduction sites in Oregon. So that is working and we feel like this is a good strong strategy. So here's where we are today with populations in the Willamette Valley. Each of these triangles represents a population that we have established. Some of them, like Kingston Prairie, um, are in areas that uh, were wetland and failed early on, but they're shown on the map here. But most of these are now existing populations. 23 uh, still have plants, and I think about nine of those that have over a thousand. So this is good news. But why, so why worry? Um, well, 
One thing we found is that when we put out a lot of seeds, we can get a lot of plants to establish in the second year after seeding. That's when the population explodes. But when we take our foot off the gas and we let these populations go without any adding any more seeds, then the populations tend to decline. And we've had a hope that they would decline to some kind of equilibrium level that was uh, something we'd like to see, but they're actually declining to very low levels in some cases, not all. But especially in those cases where we've been able to just put seeds out once and, and uh, not add seed addition continue, which is one of the strategies we also use. So when we just put them out once and watch what happens, we have a longer period of time, we're seeing declines. That also happens in plug pot plots. They tend to uh, do well and then maybe have a bump, but then stabilize. We're not able to put out nearly as many plants uh, when we put out plugs, but in some cases in Oregon anyway, the plugs seem to be working uh, well. However, I'm sad to report that in Washington state, all of the plug introductions have failed, all of them. It's only seed uh, uh, establishments that have succeeded and they're showing this kind of similar pattern of ups and downs. It can be a boom and bust cycle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're concerned. Um, this is, we're not out of the woods yet. Much of what we need to learn still is around how to manage the habitats for this species. Um, fire is an important tool for restoring populations of the species. Um, although right now, probably decidedly unpopular, but as a rest restoration tool, very important. And these, this is now some photographs of restored prairies where we at the Institute for Applied Ecology have worked and established golden paintbrush. The process of establishing golden paintbrush includes establishing healthy prairie in general. And that's what we've been doing is we're, we're restoring prairies, we're restoring the whole system. And golden paintbrush is a part of that. In this photograph, we're restoring golden paintbrush and another endangered plant called Kincaid's lupin, which itself is the host plant for a butterfly, the Fender's blue butterfly. So when we do this kind of restoration, we can get a bigger bang for our buck. And in the process, train the next generation of ecologists that are engaging with us as interns and, and technicians and moving up the ladder and becoming restorationists and scientists in their own right. Many of these people have helped us track these populations, count them through time, and uh, establish our data set so that we know what's really going on in Oregon. It's, it's a, a large task every summer. Um, these populations, some of them are large. They take a while to, to either subsample or count, but they're, it's exciting to be able to go to this many restored prairies and see success. And one of the things we've found also with this species of uh, golden paintbrush is that it itself is the host plant or can be the host plant for an endangered butterfly, the Taylor's checker spot. So Taylor's checker spot can, can use this Red, harsh paintbrush, that's what it used primarily historically, but it also appears to have used golden paintbrush historically. And now they're in Oregon, there are only two populations of this butterfly left and they rely on a different plant, a weed that has invaded these habitats called English plantain. And if it weren't for this weeds invasion, we probably wouldn't have this butterfly here at all. But when we reestablish habitat for this butterfly, we now know we can use other species, native species, including golden paintbrush as part of that mix. And here's a, um, a, uh, a, a caterpillar of the um, Taylor's checker spot feeding on a golden paintbrush in winter, which is an important feeding time for the species. Um, and here's another, here's the, here's the English plantain and here's the caterpillar feeding on English plantain uh, in the, right before going into uh, it's chrysalis and then emerging as a butterfly. And here's a golden paintbrush to close that is being fed on by a brand new cluster of, of uh, Taylor's checker spot seedlings at one of our introduction sites, which overlaps with one of the remaining Taylor's checker spot populations. So we're very pleased that this kind of restoration can overlap with uh, the recovery of multiple species, not just Kincaid's lupin or, or golden paintbrush, but we can stack this conservation on one, on one site and achieve multiple conservation goals. 
And I could keep going, but I'm going to stop there and open this up for questions. And I, I hope you've enjoyed this, this story, which for me is, is fascinating and takes interesting twists and turns and really shows that when we do the science and then apply that science, we can make an enormous difference for these endangered species. So thank you. Oh, that's awesome. So if we had a crowd, Tom, it'd be a big round of applause for your efforts. Um, <laughs> I, I, just have, you for yeah, I just have to say, um, the mere fact that you have introduced a term to me uh, as a, not only a science geek, but a sci-fi geek of the potential of an underground vampire, um, you sort of made my botanical <laughs> night, if you will. Um, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And then you went just that much further with the stealing of the superpowers and I could go on and on yeah. uh, uh, about the fantastic heroes and heroines that might have those abilities. Well, one thing I don't know that you should know, we, we don't know yet if garlic is immune to uh, this plant underground. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know how to help you if it gets into your yard. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, it's super, super fascinating work. Um, we definitely have some questions from folks tonight, and we'll kind of jump in with that. Um, and I'm going to do my absolute best to translate these because I think these folks share your same passion um, for some of your research. So first question up, um, is it possible to use a genetic sequencing of an endangered plant to determine its quote unquote optimal habitat area based on the genetic sequ sequencing of plants and hosts that exists in other areas. That is a deep one. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that would be a, a, an interesting application of genomic ecology, of taking broader samples from say the soil and, and plants in a whole community and using that as your signal of habitat suitability. And that's something we have not done, uh, but is, is possible. And certainly the organisms that occur in soils have extremely large, almost dictatorial powers over what can grow on a site. Um, but the same is true in the other direction. What plants are growing there has strong effects on that underground biological community. So uh, understanding how these things link together and interact is, is really important. And we're just scratching the surface of that in, in ecology and a genomic tool would really be a helpful one. So I, I can't say much more than that right now. New future project. That's awesome. <laughs> um, let's see here. What did you, I would say there was that one particular picture when you talked about um, that field that you had planted in, and I can't remember if it was seed um, or not, but what did you use to kill the mixed species in that field? And would it have any impact on the paintbrush? Oh, good question. So um, to paraphrase, what, what, how did we kill all the standing vegetation and then plant paintbrush? And would that have a bad effect on the paintbrush or other things? And what we used was glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, which one of the um, advantages of that for an ecological experiment like this is that when Roundup hits the soil or when glyphosate hits the soil, it is very quickly bound up by soil particles and it does not translocate throughout the system. And so it's essentially stopped dead in its tracks. While when it's on a plant, if the plant's green, it is translocated throughout the plant systemically and kills the plant. So it has this sort of, uh, I guess, ecologically targeted uh, pattern that makes it so that we weren't worried about its effect on, on golden paintbrush in that context. If we had used something with a soil residual quality to kill that standing vegetation, then we might in indeed have had a hard time even growing golden paintbrush there, much less um, growing it with another host, those hosts might have died too. Or we might have had interesting interactions where some hosts were more susceptible to a, a pre-emergent or a persistent seed uh, uh, herbicide, while others might not be. And that could have explained our differences, but we're convinced that's not what happened in this case. No, oh, excellent, excellent. Um, another one, let's see. Looks like, uh, do you add those native perennials that the paintbrush parasitize well uh, with into your seeding? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, it's funny. We, we're, uh, we're smart enough to use the, the plants that seem to be good hosts in our seed mixes and dumb enough to use some of those hosts that are bad hosts <laughs> in the seed mixes as well, in part because there are only so many species we have access to for restoring a prairie. And we're trying to restore the whole prairie. And even if some of these hosts are not optimal, we want them in the mix for other aspects of prairie ecology, for pollinators, for the underground soil biota, et cetera. So they have 
they have more the, of a role than just golden paintbrush, we, we know, and, and we're not so um, golden paintbrush centric that we're gonna ignore the whole system. We're trying to keep a whole system functioning and golden paintbrush is just a piece of that. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, next up, let's see. Um, how many years of yearly or biannual seeding would you expect to be required for a population to persist with ongoing landscape management? Great question. Uh, you know, should we just put the seeds out once or do we, are we gonna have to sort of repeatedly seed, especially if we're managing during that process? And I think what we're learning is that we may need to repeatedly seed. Um, that's actually been one of the Achilles heels of our science is repeated seeding because it, it takes longer than to figure out how long a population lasts without seeding. But some populations we have held back and we've seen these, these boom and bust cycles. And others where we have done continued management and reseeding, we are seeing the greater stability. And uh, we're still learning from that if that's a real stability or just it takes longer for the population to decline because it's been more recent since we seeded. So we're, we're still learning from that. But I think there's something to that. I think um, uh, even with invasive species, when they enter a new part of the world, sometimes they fail. They have to be uh, introduced multiple times, sometimes to the same site before they take and then explode. So we shouldn't expect the introduction of an end endangered species to be any better than an invasive species. In fact, it should be worse. So if that's one of the lessons from invasive species, we should learn from that too, that sometimes multiple introductions are required. Excellent. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit, because I think um, clearly graduate students, interns, the student focus around your projects is super, super important. Um, is there anything particular that you have learned about yourself in supervising and kind of mentoring these new, young, brilliant minds that are coming into the field? Well, I guess if there's, if there's any lesson about, you know, what have, uh, have I learned about myself is that it's that I have a lot to learn from students. Uh, really, uh, the students have have great insight and and learn. I you know what I've learned has been largely from their efforts as well. So even though we work collaboratively, they're working creatively, and some of their ideas are brilliant and have really advanced this the science of the species. And it's because of that those collaborations with students and other colleagues that we've made made these advances. So yeah, my hats off to students. They're they're. Um, you know, these are great individuals that have gone on themselves into interesting careers doing ecology. So I'm, I'm really very grateful to have had the, the, uh, the opportunity to work with such interesting and, and talented people. It's, I mean, it's such an interesting and a really good way work environment, because I think that's the thing is like that cycle continues of like the new minds coming in generationally just continue to add more and more to the field. So it's like we need the experts, but yet we also need these kind of young, fresh minds and ways of looking at, 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 at the world. I think it's just it's an incredible cycle that I think higher education can provide. So yeah. I I, it's a lot of fun hearing you all as faculty <laughs> talk about those interactions because I think it, it, it brings such vibrancy um, yeah. to, to, the, to your work. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question coming up. If, we've talked a little bit about maybe potential uh, dream projects, but is there one dream project um, to work on right now? Like if you could work on that, what would that be? <laughs> uh, well, my dream project right, right now is to conduct habitat restoration in prairies and uh, basically conduct a replicated experiment that has a single replicate at many, many locations where we can study the opportunities, the, the success of our restoration techniques and compare techniques at many different locations because by, do, by spreading our sample across a large landscape, we can start to learn how the soil affects our success and interacts with our treatments, how the seed bank of weeds affects and, and uh, um, interacts with our treatments so that we can become much more prescriptive and uh, uh, successful in our restorations. Because right now, when we do a restoration, sometimes they fail and often we don't really know why. Many of the species in our seed mix just don't even come up. W why is that? We don't know yet. And it, the opportunity to learn the answer to that is right in front of us. We just need to experiment with it. And, and this, this egg too will be cracked. And so we, we're ready to go for that. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
Uh, let's see. Looks like. Oh, I mean, I guess kind of themed, uh, unfortunate theme right now around fire. What is the restorative function of fire specifically for uh, the golden paintbrush? So uh, what, what fire tends to do in prairies is a couple of different things. It um, can create a seed bed by burning off the dead grass, the thatch, and opening up the soil so that there is good soil seed contact. And that's crucial for golden paintbrush and many other species. And of course, Golden paintbrush requires those other species. So we have to have a healthy establishment of all these species. Um, another thing it does is it can create a pulse or release a pulse of nutrients into the uh, uh, environment from the ash. And uh, those, those nutrients can stimulate the regrowth of those plants that were already there, as well as the seedlings of other plants that are growing. So it has a stimulative effect. Um, and then there's some species that are just plain stimulated by fire. They regrow very well. Um, in part because some of the species are knocked back and the competition is reduced, so those survivors do really well. So there's, we can go on, but those are three of the main mechanisms for why fire is an important part of managing habitat for golden paintbrush and getting established from, from the beginning. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let's see here. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, did all of your wetland plantings fail or just the one that you mentioned? or to put it more directly, does golden paintbrush have a place in wetland ecosystems? Yeah, great, great question. All of them failed. And no, it doesn't have a place in wetland <laughs> restoration. We kind of thought it would uh, because there's so much wetland in the Willamette Valley. And you remember that herbarium specimen that I pointed out that said, found growing in moist ground? Well, we thought, ah, oh, it's a wetland plant. You know, we got to check that. It, it was just wrong. It, it, it must've been a wet day or he had wet feet when he wrote that label, but it was, it was not a wetland. Uh, we feel confident in that. Awesome. Let's see, next up, let's see here, going through the different channels. Um... Oh, okay. So through the research that you, and this one, I will say this question comes up a lot. We've done some things with the uh, Marine Studies Initiative. We've had a number of these live casts where this is like the concept of global warming has been put in here. But through the research you've done, have you seen any change in habitats due to things such as global warming or maybe other related um, entities that may be currently existing, whether that's something you hypothesize, hypothesize or something you've actually seen in the research? Yeah, great question. And there is good research on, say, prairies in particular and how they're responding to climate change. That generally, when things get really hot and dry, we have a conversion over to more annuals. And that's bad news for golden paintbrush. And in fact, one could argue that we're insane because we're, instead of moving this species further north, we've been taking it from Washington, bringing it south back to Oregon. And maybe that's not so smart. But the bottom line with global climate change is there's so many indirect effects that can occur that we don't really know what the effects are going to be on many individual species. You know, what limits the species in the South may not always be, say, heat and hosts, but could have to do with voles, for example, or other predators or things that, that eat it or cause it harm some diseases. And a change in climate could actually help the species. That's a possibility. And, you know, in some of our work looking at the demographics of endangered species and climate change, we found that some species actually might benefit because they tend to do better in these warmer, drier years. But it's very difficult to predict. And so we're, we're not ready to cross the species off the list simply because it's having, it's had trouble in the past in the southern part of its range. So we're, we're going to bide our time with that. And have we noticed other changes? Well, yeah, sometimes we go out to sites and we notice kills of Douglas fir. Douglas fir, Oregon's state tree, can be succumbing to, to global climate change in these hotter, drier years. So, um, you know, these, these fires uh, also are causing a lot of us to scratch our heads and wonder, what will these forests look like in the future with that kind of disturbance from climate change? So. Uh, it's a brave new world, and uh, but we've got to be brave with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I'll have to say, you brought up the voles. I was like, I was thinking in your head, like what it must have been like to go through those different uh, variables as far as the types of plants that they were planted with. And it's like, oh, let's just throw a vole in there. It's just another variable that's. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. <laughs> 
so I, I had to chuckle a little bit um because i yeah that's again i've never done any type of the research like you're talking about but i sure know about adding variables you did not anticipate so. you know that's a good example of working with a student who gets even more intimately involved in the experiment than i am who can actually start making that observation and go hey wait huh i think it's the voles and then tease out that from our data set so you know that's what happened in that case yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. Um, let's see. There's one in here via Mentimeter. Um, we saw what we thought was a light yellow uh, Indian paintbrush in the Strawberry Mountains this year. Was this a different species or related to your work? Yeah, great, great question. And the answer is yes, it was a different species. Uh, there are other yellow paintbrushes. But one of the things that's, that's interesting is that many of the yellow paintbrushes are part of a species that has a mix of colors. They can be red or orange or yellow, and that's just also other species of paintbrush that are only yellow. So that, that can happen. And remember I showed a picture of that other harsh paintbrush, the red one? Paint that species and golden paintbrush can hybridize, and their, hy their progeny can be orange or red or yellow, and they can create this this wild spectrum where they come together. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, you all, and thank you for the questions. Keep coming to me. I've, I've got so many that I'm trying to, to go through here. So that's great. So thank you for submitting those. Um, kind of a, maybe a general question for folks that are concerned about um, other invasive species, but uh, can you just pull an invasive species plant, let it dry on the road and that's good enough? Or what's What's proper disposal of something that we'd be trying to get rid of? Well, I've certainly done that. So yes, uh, but the, the problem is when it, you pull it out of the ground and let it just dry out, if it has already gone past flower enough that it's making seeds, it may still be able to mature those seeds. And then you've basically planted it on the roadside and it'll, it'll come back probably. So it's best to, if it's at that stage, if it's already gone past flower to bag it and get it out of there. Excellent. Let's see here. Um, oh, here we go. Here's another one. Um, have there been any cases where the native seeded perennials have outcompeted the paintbrush? Um, I think it's possible for uh, grasses to get really thick and thatchy and create an environment that's sort of too much competition for golden paintbrush. You know, and, and one example of that is. We, we know that Romer's fescue, for example, can be a good host for golden paintbrush. We grew it agriculturally with, uh, with Romer's fescue. Romer's fescue is a kind of grass. And however, if you grow it with Romer's fescue in a pot, if the pot's too small, the grass very quickly uses its fibrous roots to just fill all of the soil and become pot bound. And there's almost just, there's just no place left for the golden paintbrush. So when you get grasses that are too thick on the ground, even in a wild site outside of a pot, if they get too thick where the roots have basically occupied all the soil, that can be too thick for golden paintbrush. Remember, it's a parasite, but it's a heavy parasite. So it sort of has to fend for itself part of the way too. So if it doesn't have enough room for its own roots, it does get out and compete it. So yeah, we can, we can have problems with that. We have to manage with um, a species mix that's not gonna overwhelm the golden paintbrush, and also a disturbance regime like mowing or fire that can knock back some of these grasses and, and highly competitive plants to keep some openings in the, in the habitat. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think the one thing with these, the virtual setups, we're getting all kinds of different types of viewers. So it looks like I'm getting a number of kind of your, your experiences questions in this one. Um, were your interests as an undergraduate the same as they are now? And I guess I'm kind of translating that to, was your experience as an undergraduate student, did it kind of foster this, this passion for what you have now or was it very different or kind of what was your experience? Well, that's a, a good question. You know, when, when I was in college, I did study ecology, and, but a lot of hard sciences too, I was, and geology. I really got into geology. And when I, when I left uh, the Evergreen State College, I applied for two summer jobs that, that following summer. One was with Olympic National Park, working as a, a botanist on a veg crew. And the other was working for the state of Washington you know, for their geological department. And I didn't get the geology job. I got the botany job. And so 
that sort of put me on the course I, I, I went on. And, and it was a wonderful job working for the Park Service, working for an ecologist and doing ecology every day. And so that's, you know, that cemented it. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I learned that smell and I stuck to it. And, and, uh, and what's interesting is, you know, golden paintbrush was a species I met in my, my senior year of college. And I stuck with it for the rest of my life. So careful what, <laughs> what you study when you're in college. It doesn't always work that way, but you know, sometimes it comes back. That's awesome. That's awesome. And Jennifer, I did see your question. I was actually coming right back to it and I'm going to butcher this name, Tom. So bear with me. So um, there's a question earlier. Um, have you, Jennifer, hold on. I'm trying to pull it up. Oh, there we go. Have you inoculated any of the plugs with, I'm going to bear with me, um, mycorrhizae? Mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae. Oh, I know yeah. I've heard it before, but yeah. bad with pronunciation. So have you inoculated any of the plugs with that? Um, great question. And in the case of Golden Paintbrush, we have not done inoculant uh, experiments. Now we have with other species and, and in other situations. And it's well known that uh, the soil microbiota have strong effects on, on plants and, uh, you know, especially legumes that, that might require rhizobium. But there are some uh, mycorrhizae that assist with nutrient. I don't know that with golden paintbrush, and, but I would be amazed if there weren't a signal there for us to find. Awesome. Uh, another question that's come in. So as a parasite, how detrimental is it to the host? <laughs> Good question. I mean, it is a parasite. It is taking resources from the host. And uh, some of our experiments have found that there can be detriments to the host and that the bigger the golden paintbrush gets, the smaller the host gets. Um, but those have been correlative uh, experiments and responses. It could be that the... Um, the smaller the host, the easier it is for a golden paintbrush to parasitize it, for example. Uh, so we, we don't really know if that's the mechanism that the, the paintbrush is draining the host, but there's no reason to assume that that's not uh, an operable hypothesis. So sure, probably, why not? It's taking, it's not giving. Right. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, hey, everybody. So that's 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 fantastic. Um, you guys asked a ton of questions tonight. I really appreciate appreciate the engagement. That's probably been one of the neatest things uh, in this kind of COVID-19 social distance atmosphere. Uh, and doing some of these questions, I think it allows for a lot of user engagement that maybe not have been there in some of the live events. So everybody that was viewing tonight, thank you so much for joining us again. Big shout out um, to Dr. K for the presentation. Uh, big shout out to Connect Central Oregon for the virtual production tonight. And just kind of on a personal note, um, we'd just like to say congratulations to all of our um, Oregon State University students who are starting up the 2020-2021 the, the uh, school year this next coming week. Um, Welcome weeks are starting on Sunday slash Monday and classes resuming on Wednesday. So we are definitely excited for that. Uh, welcome to all of our new first year students that are joining us. Um, and again, for all of our returning students, hope that you uh, keep doing a great job in your classes. You're getting engaged in research projects like this. Um, and again, we're just so happy to kind of, this is a great energy for me starting the school year. I know the world has been through a lot this year, but I think this is always a very enjoyable time for me uh, as a campus administrator. And I know Tom, probably for you of getting everybody back in and start the school year off. So I think again, just like to thank you so much for your time and uh, for everyone, I'd say uh, thank you for joining us again. This concludes our science pub for September 14th, 2020. And again, really appreciate your, uh, appreciate your participation and we'll see you in a month. Thanks Nathan and bye everybody.